May it please the court, Alex Brockmeyer on behalf of the appellant, George Tunison. This time I would like to reserve five minutes for rebuttal. There are two issues before the court here today. The first is whether the trial court erred in determining Mr. Tunison waived entitlement to attorney's fees by failing to plead entitlement in his motion to dismiss. The second issue on appeal is whether Mr. Tunison's motion was legally sufficient. With regard to the first issue, it is our contention that the trial court erred in determining Mr. Tunison waived entitlement. The reason for that is, is because a party need not plead entitlement in a motion to dismiss. Under the Florida Supreme Court case of Green v. Sun Harbor and this court's opinion in Bruce v. Barkham, where a case is disposed of before the time has come for a defendant to file a response of pleading, the defendant can seek entitlement to attorney's fees by filing a motion for attorney's fees under Rule 1.525 of the Florida Rules of Civil Procedure. Mr. Tunison did this in a timely manner. Therefore, under Bruce v. Barkham and Green v. Sun Harbor, Mr. Tunison did not waive entitlement to attorney's fees. And unless this court has any issues with regard or questions with regard to this issue, I'm going to proceed to the second issue. The second issue here on appeal is the sufficiency of Mr. Tunison's motion. The trial court and Bank of America here on appeal rely upon this court's case of Carmen v. Gilbert to support its argument that Mr. Tunison's motion was legally insufficient. And their reliance upon Carmen is misplaced for two reasons. The first of which is that Carmen construed Stockman's pleading standard. It did not assess the legal sufficiency of a motion for attorney's fees, and thus it is distinguishable from the facts presented by this case. The second basis on which Carmen cannot support the trial court or Bank of America's argument is that it was, even if Carmen were applicable, it was implicitly abrogated by the Florida Supreme Court case of Caulfield v. Cantilli. Bank of America and the trial court rely upon Carmen for the position that a party in pleading entitlement to attorney's fees must make a specific showing of entitlement, that you have to cite the specific contractual basis for attorney's fees. But Caulfield explicitly rejected that when it held that all that is required under Stockman is to make a general statement of entitlement. And so even if Carmen were applicable to this matter, it would not be controlling. If Stockman's pleading standard were somehow to control the sufficiency of Mr. Tunison's motion, all that would be required, according to Caulfield, is a general statement of entitlement to attorney's fees. So for those two reasons, Carmen cannot support Bank of America's argument or the trial court's position that Mr. Tunison's motion for attorney's fees was legally insufficient. And it's our position that the proper standard of which we should assess Mr. Tunison's motion is under Rule 1.10b and Rule 1.525 of Florida's Rules of Civil Procedure. If we look at Rule 1.525, we see that it does not specify what exactly a motion for attorney's fees must contain. This court noted as much in a footnote in Parrott Cove Marina. So we look to Rule 1.10b to assess the sufficiency of a motion for attorney's fees. And Rule 1.10b has essentially two requirements that every motion must contain. You have to have the relief being requested and the grounds of why you're entitled to that relief. And under this standard, we require those two elements so that the non-moving party has notice of what the moving party is seeking and why they are seeking that. We're trying to preclude parties from pulling the gotcha sort of moment. We want everybody to have due process so they can come to the trial court prepared to address matters on their merits. And here, if we look at Mr. Tunison's motion, it's our position that it was legally sufficient because it placed Bank of America on notice that he was seeking attorney's fees 
as the prevailing party by virtue of Bank of America's voluntary dismissal. Did Bank of America's initial complaint itself request fees from your client? It did, Your Honor, yes. Page three of the record, page three Based of- Based on the contracts? Yes, under the note mortgage, it says that explicitly. And it's our position that based on that, they knew that the note and mortgage was a legal basis for entitlement to attorney's fees. Yet, when it came time for them to respond to Mr. Tunison's motion, they never said that there was no legal basis for entitlement to attorney's fees. They never disputed the same basis that they knew existed in the record because they, they were on not, they knew that there was a basis in the record and they never disputed it. Is there anything in the record on this conditional voluntary dismissal that, which suggested it was negotiated or agreed to by your side? There is not, Your Honor. And it is, to the best of my knowledge, I was not trial counsel, but it is my understanding that it was a unilateral voluntary dismissal filed by Bank of America. And because it was unilateral and not stipulated to, under this court's opinion in Cary v. State Farm, that conditioning language is not binding upon Mr. Tunison because he did not agree to that language. And thus, the dismissal stands, but the language conditioning the dismissal on attorney's fees is non-binding. And so Mr. Tunison could seek attorney's fees under the note and mortgage, which he did so. And so it's our position that because Bank of America knew that the note and mortgage was the legal basis for attorney's fees and they never contested it, it places this matter within the grounds of McDaniel v. Edmonds because the legal basis for entitlement in the record was not disputed. And where the legal basis for entitlement to attorney's fees is not disputed, the moving party need not cite the legal basis in their motion for attorney's fees. Well, arguably, I mean, the provision for attorney's fees in the note and mortgage doesn't get you home because you'd still have to rely on 57-1057, which would make that reciprocal. Certainly, that is something that we would have to essentially prove, but I assume that the court is kind of hinting at that we would have to have essentially stated 57-105 in our motion. But as attorneys, and we're presumed to know that 57-105 in this sort of scenario would be reciprocal. And so where the note and mortgage says entitled to prevailing party attorney's fees, they're on notice that 57-105 and its reciprocal provisions under subsection 7 applies to Mr. Tunison as well. If you file a motion for attorney's fees similar to this in an appellate court and you simply say that you're entitled to fees and costs and you don't identify the legal grounds for your entitlement, we regularly deny those. Certainly, Your Honor. And in our brief, we make the distinction between the appellate court and the trial court. And our basis for that distinction is this. When I'm coming before this court with a motion for attorney's fees, I do not get to come in for a hearing and argue to the trial court or argue to this court, Judge Alterburn, in subsection and paragraph 14 of the mortgage, it provides for prevailing party attorney's fees. We don't get to do that. We have to identify this for this court so that it can go and look and see that. Well, there's no discovery either. No, exactly. But in the trial court, we have those discovery tools and we're able to go into the trial court and say to the judge, in this case, Judge Lobota, paragraph 14 of the mortgage page, I think 12 of the mortgage says, attorney's fees are provided to the prevailing party. So we're able to go in and argue that and direct the court to that point in the mortgage so that they can make that determination whether or not we were the prevailing party. Now here, we never got to that point at whether or not we were the prevailing party. The court here made its determinations purely on our waiver issue and the legal insufficiency. And so the factual determination that the trial court would have had to made as to whether or not we were the prevailing party, that's not up here on appeal. I just, I want to clarify that because I am saying that, you know, we're able to go in and direct the trial court to that point in the mortgage. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. Hoffman. Th
point in the mortgage and then say we are the prevailing party pursuant to that provision. But there is a distinction between the appellate court where we have no discovery tools. We aren't able to come before the court and say, this is where it is in the mortgage. This is where it is in the note. We can do that in the trial court. And for those reasons, it is our contention that a specific legal basis need not have been cited with regard to Mr. Tunison's motion for attorney's fees. And the trial court erred in determining that Mr. Tunison's motion was legally insufficient. It also erred in determining that Mr. Tunison waived entitlement to attorney's fees because he need not have pled entitlement in his motion to dismiss. And we would therefore request that this court reverse as to both issues and remand for further proceedings. And unless this court has any questions, I will address any arguments on rebuttal. Thank you. May it please the court, Mark Dauphin on behalf of the Appellate Bank of America. I think the court began to address what I think is a critical issue with regard to the language in the motion and the voluntary dismissal. In the Stockman case, the court was concerned regarding whether or not the notice of the attempt to collect attorney's fees was sufficient for the parties to be aware that somebody was seeking that. And they expressed these concerns because we don't want a gotcha moment, as counsel alluded to. What we have here- Well, this is a foreclosure case. Everybody knows that these clauses are going to be in those documents and that whoever wins is the prevailing party, right? Well, that's not always necessarily true. For example, when you talk about why somebody would voluntarily dismiss a case, particularly at this stage of the proceedings, it is entirely possible that the reason the case was dismissed was because the party came in and cured the default. A voluntary dismissal would be filed. And under that circumstance, the record would reflect exactly what is reflected here. But it certainly would not be an equitable result that the defendant could come in and say, well, you voluntarily dismissed the case. And even though we took this activity to resolve the case and take the case out of default and made the foreclosure moot, there we should be entitled to our attorney's fees. The order here denies it because entitlement was not pled? Entitlement was not pled. The motion to dismiss was not a pleading. And the time period- So they never had an opportunity to plead. And there is case law that indicates that they would then be entitled to file a motion on the issue. However, what the Stockman case was talking about is one of the things that we don't know before this court right now today is what happened at that hearing. What happened at the hearing where the denial was there? Why the case was dismissed? A transcript would be a wonderful thing that would clarify a lot of these issues. But we don't have that transcript before us. So we are now having- If there were some kind of a settlement, as you suggest, and the borrower cured the default, I would expect to see a stipulation for settlement that provided that each party would bear their own costs or something like that rather than a voluntary dismissal. In a perfect world, Your Honor, that would be a wonderful thing. It doesn't always happen that way. But the language of the voluntary dismissal was before the court. I mean, that was filed. It has been recorded. It was before the court at the time. But what authorizes you to file that? It's a conditional voluntary dismissal. Is there some place in the rules that allows for a conditional voluntary dismissal? If the parties agree to it, Your Honor, you can file- We have a case called Hamerill v. State, 779 Southern 2nd 410, where we, every single week, cite this to prisoners and say you can't file a conditional voluntary dismissal of your appeal. You either dismiss it or you don't. And I know of nothing that says you can do a conditional voluntary dismissal in a trial court as well. Well, I mean, the notion of whether or not something is conditional, I think it depends on whether you're saying we're filing it on the condition or that the reason we're filing it because the condition has been met 
and that's why we're filing it. So we're only filing it based upon the information we have in front of us, which was an agreement. Or, and I'm not suggesting to this court that there was an agreement. I don't know the answer to that. And I, I, don't, I want to be clear on that. I mean, normally, if there is an agreement, there is a stipulation for dismissal, and it's signed by both sides. You don't have that. And, uh, you're, and you're like, you know, is, is there any other case that has recognized a conditional voluntary dismissal of the sort that we have in this case? Well, Your Honor, I don't, I, I've not found any cases like that. What I would suggest to this court, however, it happens uh, a lot, saying this is why we are doing it, because we have the agreement not that we're doing it only if you agree. That's in two entirely different um, dynamics. The language, however, was before the trial court at the time. If, it was, if your voluntary dismissal was conditioned on that and they didn't agree to the condition, isn't, isn't it such that that case is still pending below? The condition was not accepted by the other side. Your Honor, that, that, would, that would be the case only if that the condition that we're talking about was not an agreed upon condition. That it is well, merely- it's not a stipulation, it is, so it's not agreed upon. It is merely reciting the agreement that this is the reason why we are doing it. But did you file, I, I don't, and the, I'll just tell you, your briefs didn't open up when I hit the button, so. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, technology, but when they filed a motion for attorney's fees, what did you file in response a to? A response it? was filed, Your Honor. A response was filed to the um, motion for attorney's fees. And you know the reality is the, most, the motion for attorney's fees was a, were four paragraphs of one sentence that simply said, we're entitled to them. We were the prevailing party without any uh, suggestion as to why. Um, and uh, it didn't refer to whether it was a contract, whether it was 57105, whether it was any of the possible um, bases for attorney's fees. Um, those, that, that was not, that, none of that was pled. And the real question becomes is does the latitude that is given in simply asserting a claim for attorney's fees in a pleading extend to the asserting a claim for attorney's fees in a motion because the courts have recognized that those are two different things, particularly- if it, was, if it was inadequate in the pleading, we would give them leave to amend, right? If, you know, if simply in a pleading, the, the, the courts seem to suggest that they could simply come in and say, we have, we, we are asserting a claim for attorney's fees and all of the notice issues that Stockman raised would be satisfied. However, this was not in a pleading and everybody concedes that it was not in the pleading. It was in a subsequent motion and whether or not the simple assertion that we're entitled to his furnace fees would extend to the filing of that motion. I thought the Cofield case resolved all of that where they said you didn't need to plead a specific con contractual or statutory basis for entitlement. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't even know why that's an issue now. Well, it was the Cofield case referred specifically to not requiring them to plead a the statutory entitlement in a pleading that you can simply make a simple assertion that we are entitled to it and that puts you on notice that they're at issue. Now we're in a situation where a subsequent motion after the, mo the voluntary dismissal was already filed, then we're saying that we're entitled to them and then the question becomes whether or not in that motion you would need to be more specific and claim why you are entitled to them beyond simply saying we're entitled to attorney's fees. I, I don't recall anything in Cofield that would suggest that. Well, Co Cofield was talking specifically, we're saying that that's the distinguishing characteristic. Cofield was talking specifically about <coughs> the pleading. And here, we're not talking about a pleading. And in the green cases that follow that, that's when the additional um, latitude was given for filing of a motion, if, if your time for filing of your pleading and your answer had not expired, or if the voluntary dismissal took place before you filed an answer, or, or things like that. But the question becomes whether or not the simple assertion in one line without giving you more is sufficient for the filing of a motion as it was, as, as Cofield 
seems to suggest it is in the following, in, in, including it in your pleading. And those are two entirely different um, well, it's, questions. It's hard for me to, as, as bare bones as this motion is, it's hard for me to understand how anybody, particularly people that are filing mortgage foreclosures for Bank of America, uh, could be misled. Well, it's not a question about being misled about what they want once they file the motion. That is, that, that is the question. The real question then becomes whether or not if, without knowing this prior to filing the voluntary dismissal, whether or not, because the Stockman and all of those cases that follow all suggest that those, the part of that is the reason why you would or would not file a voluntary dismissal because whether or not attorney's fees are at issue, um, the amount, what your basis for the attorney's fees would be. I, I thought the Green case said that in, in this situation where an answer was never required to be filed, it was sufficient for you to file the motion for fees if you did it within 30 days after the voluntary dismissal. It was, it is, that's what the Green case does suggest, Your Honor. However, the question is, and Green and none of its other cases that related to the same issue, none of them suggest as to what has to be included in the motion and what specificity has to be included in the motion. 1.1.100. Well, what, 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 what would be the case that we could look at to say that what's sufficient in a pleading under Cofield is not sufficient in a motion that's filed after a voluntary dismissal? Is there any, any authority that suggests that there is that kind of a distinction? Well, the only authority that I would cite you to is the 1.100 that counsel has referred this court to, which talks about the specificity that, that it must be specifically pled and that it, it uses the word, I think, with particularity. I, I don't know if it uses specificity, but I'm going from memory. I think it uses particularity. And that, I mean, I have not found a case on that, on this particular issue, Your Honor, but well, if, if, if Cofield is a Supreme Court case and they have the final say, why aren't we required to follow Cofield? Again, because I think Cofield is limited to the pleading. And that is, is not a distinction without a difference. I, I think that that is a substantive uh, distinction between the two. Again, the lack of the transcript in this case is makes it difficult not only for this court, but it makes it difficult for the parties. Neither firm that's here before you today was involved in the case at the, the trial the level. The trial judge, or somebody, hand wrote this order, and it takes up an entire page, and, and the trial judge was pretty specific. Uh, I don't know if it's about her, about the basis for her rulings, and she gives two separate rulings and, and cites, I think, two cases for one and then a third case for another. So it's, it's, it's not like we need a Ouija board to figure out what the judge was thinking. Well, we, it's not, you're, you're correct. We don't need a Ouija board to suggest what the judge um, put in the order. And, and there's nothing to suggest that this was an evidentiary <coughs> or that there were concessions made by either side on I, I, you know, I, I mean, I, I wish I could really give the court some clarification on what that was. I really don't know. Um, I do know that it was the hearing as it related to entitlement. And that's what is, is to end the order, that this was the hearing on the entitlement. And the rest of these matters were addressed um, at some point during the hearing. I don't know. I, I can't give the court specifics on, on what that was. But when you are addressing to the entitlement, because if you look at the motion, as bare bones as it is, if you look at the motion, they uh, are simply asking for a determination of that they're entitled to their fees and costs. And they give what they consider to be the basis for why they should do that. We don't know if the trial court at that point determined they're not the prevailing party based upon information that went on at the hearing. We don't know if the trial, the trial court didn't certainly didn't say that. It didn't, didn't say one way or the reason. other. The trial court did not say one way or the other. And again, like I said, it, it, it sort of hamstrings both the court and the parties because we're all sitting here now trying to figure out what the court, what the trial court 
heard, didn't hear, contemplate, didn't hear, contemplate it, didn't contemplate, um, and that makes it, you know, I can, I can surmise, I can, but I can't give this court any definitive answers as to those issues. Um, with respect to the, I'm trying to think, uh, uh, if this court has any other questions, I'm certainly happy, happy to answer those questions, but we think that the trial court, based upon what we know about what it contemplated, based upon the uh, information that was before it, we think the trial court properly determined that the, um, the record before did not warrant granting attorney's fees to the defendant under these circumstances, and we would ask this court to affirm. Okay. Thank you. Rebuttal. Your Honor, I, I think the issues are pretty clear. Uh, unless you guys have any, unless the, the court has any questions, I'll waive my rebuttal okay. time. Thank you very much. Thank you. That concludes our docket. The court will be adjourned.